Hello instructors, today we are going to discuss classroom management or creating a positive learning environment within your classroom. What is classroom management? Basically, classroom management refers to the skills and techniques employed by the instructor to manage the classroom and students to promote the optimal learning outcome. It's about creating an environment where the students feel safe and fostering trust between you and the students. Simply put, it's how you help your students learn as much as they possibly can. Hi, my name is Luke Smith. I have over six years of teaching experience in the subjects of Spanish and entrepreneurship. For over 15 years, I've done marketing and business development for a range of different companies. And I've developed training for organizations of over 100,000 employees. If you'd like to connect with me, I've listed some of my social profiles down there. You can log on, say hi, or ask a few questions if you'd like. As healthcare professionals, one of our responsibilities is to create a comfortable home-like environment for our residents. Residents make a big transition when they move to a facility. A comfortable and welcoming home environment not only enhances the quality of care, but also promotes more healthful living. This relates to the classroom environment as well. Just as healthcare professionals have the responsibility to make residents feel safe and comfortable, it is our responsibility as teachers, instructors, and trainers to create the best possible learning environment for our students. As we discuss this idea of classroom management, we're going to go over these different concepts. First, how to know and understand your students. How to build professional relationships with them. How to establish classroom norms and why the instructor should model the ideal behavior. We're going to talk about encouraging participation from your students. We're also going to talk about giving and receiving feedback, and then offering praise when the student does something good. We're going to talk about taking care of issues that arise quickly in the classroom, how to build excitement, and finally, as instructors, it's important to reflect upon what you're doing in the classroom and improve your instructional practices and renew yourself so that you're ready for the next and new day. Our students, when they come to our classroom, are making a major life transition. Some are starting their first career ever, and others are trying to launch a new career. They are hopeful, excited, and nervous. And in today's day and age, especially with distance learning, our students are more diverse than ever in terms of ages, gender, ethnicity and culture, languages, backgrounds, and learning styles. One of the challenges as an instructor is to address the generational differences among your students. Each generation is characterized by general traits and behaviors. These generational differences include variations in learning behaviors and preferences. And it's important to note that your students are not always aware of how these differences in generation affect them or their learning styles. Here's a quick overview of some of the different characteristics between generations. Baby boomers, or people born between 1946 and 1964, tend to have a strong work ethic. They're self-assured, competitive, goal-centric, resourceful, mentally focused, team-oriented, and disciplined. Generation X, or people born between 1965 and 1979, tend to be a little more skeptical or cynical about the world around them. They're independent, entrepreneurial, problem solvers, they defy authority, and they reject this idea of pay your dues or having to earn your stripes. They're reality-driven, and they value freedom. Generation Y, or people born between 1980 and 1995, otherwise known as millennials, tend to be optimists. They appreciate immediate feedback. They have shorter attention spans. This generation is connected 24-7 online or on their devices. They deal with authority. They're team-oriented, achievement-oriented, and confident. Generation Z are people born between 1996 and 2012. This generation are digital natives. In other words, they were born into this age of mobile technology and have never known life without it. They're globally diverse, so they think more on a global or Earth scale than previous generations. They tend to be higher anxiety. They're socially oriented, visual learners, change makers. They're financially focused and can also be quite competitive. Along with the generational differences, there are also differences in learning preferences. Some strategies you can employ when teaching those from the baby boomer generation are 
to challenge them. Try and build interactive hands-on lessons. Provide support. Give praise and feedback. Don't shy away from technology, but keep it simple. And as much as possible, try to incorporate their past experiences into the class. When teaching those from Generation X, some of the strategies you can use are communicate directly and immediately. Provide clear instructions. Don't micromanage, allow them some freedom. Base teaching in real world context or bring some of your own experiences into the classroom. Allow time to work individually. And as much as possible, use technology, games, and case studies. Generation Y teaching strategies. Use alternatives in communication such as text or email. Keep objectives and standards clear. Incorporate technology and multimedia such as videos. Provide opportunities to multitask or keep them busy. Allow them to work together. Accept feedback and suggestions. And try connecting in different ways such as on social media. Teaching strategies for Generation Z. Go digital. Don't be afraid to put your assignments, assessments, and everything online. Teach in chunks meaning break the lesson into shorter segments of content. Use graphics and images. Adapt your communication style to match theirs. Make instruction relevant to their generation. This generation also enjoys games and friendly competition. And provide caring and positive feedback. When instructing a multi-generational classroom, Adapting and responding to generational differences can go a long way in improving and enhancing learning. In terms of generations, look beyond your own personal biases. Don't get hung up on where people fit or what generation they're in. Identify values and learning preferences. Establish an even playing field by having your rules and expectations and then apply those consistently and equally. Find common ground because even though there are all these differences, there's also a lot of similarities and expect commitment and accountability from all your students. As well as generational differences, you might also encounter cultural differences when it comes to learning. Cultural differences can affect learning and how we relate to our students in many ways. For example, many countries have different ideas when it comes to respect for authority. In the United States, we recognize those of authority, but we still tend to view ourselves as equals. Other countries may view people in authority, such as an instructor, very differently, and we need to be sensitive to these views. We need to be aware of our body language and the signals that we're sending with our movements and gestures. Some cultures even view the making of eye contact differently. Some cultures have very different views in regards to gender and the roles of man and woman. Cultures also vary in their communication styles. Some cultures may be very comfortable with making interruptions, while other cultures may see, see that as a sign of disrespect and just sit there in silence. This also relates to asking questions. Cultures view making mistakes very differently. And even educational practices and testing methods vary from country to country or culture to culture. So to address these needs, we need to have culturally responsive instruction. Students come to class with a range of skills and experience. Culturally responsive instruction makes the students feel capable and confident in their abilities. When instruction is not responsive to the cultural needs or differences of our students, they may feel that their skills and experience that they've accumulated over a lifetime are essentially useless. A lack of cultural responsiveness can lead to frustration, both on part of the students and instructors. It can lead to struggles and issues in class learning and behavior. It can foster self-doubt and students may start to question their ability to succeed. It can also lead to a feeling of judgment as students are considered problematic or incapable of accomplishing the task put before them. To create a culturally responsive environment, you need to focus on building rapport and trust with your students. Recognize as much as possible the individual strengths of your students. Value their different experiences and beliefs. As an instructor, you can identify areas for growth and provide examples or demonstrations so they can see how things work. Create personal connections, and if possible, allow time for students to use their prior knowledge to assist their understanding. The ultimate goal is to give our students the best possible chance to achieve their goals through learning and by modeling competency and professionalism. The key to success. 
there really is no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to addressing all the needs of our students. However, the foundation to a successful learning experience is the student-teacher relationship, which means that you should build rapport with your students. Rapport is defined as a close, harmonious relationship in which the people or groups concerned understand each other's feelings or ideas and communicate well. Student-teacher rapport. Just as in any relationship, the stronger it is, the more obstacles that can be overcome. The benefits of a strong student-teacher relationship in a classroom are numerous and can include just the fact that it helps reduce student anxiety. They feel less nervous or uncomfortable in the class. This increases motivation and promotes participation. This relationship is the foundation for resolving any issues that might come up in class. It creates a more positive learning environment and just overall increases learning. Building rapport can do so the student learning takes work. It means as an instructor that you should know your students. Learn something about them. Be sure to explain your policies clearly and then be consistent in how you apply them. Come to class enthusiastic and do your best to engage students. Show genuine interest in them. Arrive early and be prepared. Recognize student achievements and give them praise. Be aware of your body language and how you're carrying yourself. And then remember, always have a smile. While building a professional relationship with your students does take work, it's also just about being there with them. Here are a few tips for fostering a healthy student-teacher relationship. Be yourself and be genuine and concerned about them. Be consistent in your communication with your students. Provide an emotionally safe learning space for them. Have a mutual respect and trust. And create avenues for feedback for, your, for you to give your students and for them to give you feedback as well. Promote true equity in the class, meaning every student counts and every student is treated fairly. Follow through on the things you say you're going to do. Again, be aware of your body language. And listen actively to your students. Ask questions, confirm their answers, and be interested. As instructors, you should be friendly, but not friends. Establishing a relationship of trust with your students requires knowing when to draw the line between being a mentor and being a friend. Students look up to you as an instructor. You are a critical factor in whether or not they are successful when starting their new career. Crossing professional boundaries can undermine the trust and confidence you have built with your students. It can create unnecessary distractions and unintended consequences such as drama in the class. Some students may view inappropriate relationships as favoritism or unfair. And these relationships can also undermine your ability to deal with any classroom issues that may arise. So. To maintain these boundaries, it's important to establish rules and expectations in the classroom. Almost more important is to apply these rules equitably and consistently for all. If you do this, you will earn the trust and confidence of your class. You'll have better control of the classroom environment. You'll be able to resolve any issues quickly, and you'll be able to maintain appropriate professional boundaries with your students. When establishing classroom norms, there's a few ways that you can approach it. First, you can work with your students to define the ideal classroom. This means get input from them. What would they like the class to be like? What do they hope for and expect from you? And then commit yourself and them to help create this ideal classroom. The instructor should also share their own expectations. Outline what you expect from each student. Detail the positive benefits of meeting these expectations. Ensure students understand what is expected, and then ask them to commit. With all this work and preparation, sometimes things still go a little off track. When this happens, consider a performance contract with the student. Outline what is expected from the student. Explain the benefits of meeting these expectations. State the consequences clearly if expectations are not met. And then ask the student to sign the contract. This document then becomes symbolic of the student's commitment and an instrument you can use to remind them if things do not improve or if the student needs a little extra motivation. Here's some examples of student expectations for a physical classroom. As an instructor, you should explain these expectations when students first come to class and then display them as a reminder when needed. The student expectations are as follows. Read the syllabus and be aware of the course timeline. Understand the expectations and follow the rules. Students are expected to be organized and turn in their work on time. Students should be prepared for class. That means read material, take notes, ask questions. Students help create an ideal learning environment. 
Each student takes responsibility for their own success, which means students should make time to study. All students should spend 10 to 15 hours outside class studying. Use resources provided, such as websites, texts, and handbooks. Be respectful of others. To limit interruptions, write down questions and then ask them at appropriate times. Get help early if you are struggling. And remind the students to relax and have fun, that this is all about them. As instructors, we need to be conscious of how our students are evolving with technology. Technology has changed and will continue to change how we live and interact, bringing with it both desirable and undesirable consequences. Some of the positive effects of technology are that we can communicate faster and easier than ever. We have virtually unlimited resources, and we now have various mediums for social interaction. Negative effects of technology include that our students feel connected, but not socially connected. In other words, they're always online, but there's a sense of no meaningful social and human connections. People tend to feel anonymous online, like they can say anything they want. There's a misconception of reality because what is portrayed online does not always accurately portray what happens in the real world. And our students' lives are full of distractions. So there is this increasing or developing idea of digital citizenship, which means that to use technology effectively in the classroom, we must teach, model, and consistently enforce appropriate online social interactions. We need to treat any online venue like a physical workplace. We should avoid and address interpersonal drama. We need to keep conversations focused on learning objectives. And we should be conscious of how our messages can be misunderstood. In other words, we need to practice internet etiquette or netiquette. Here are some examples of student expectations for a virtual classroom. These expectations would apply to any Zoom, Google Meets, or online meeting. Again, this is something that the instructor should display and explain during the very first class session, and then display periodically as needed for a reminder, or if you like, make it a permanent part of the introduction of each of your classes. You should explain the expectations as follows. When joining a virtual classroom, students should always use their real name. Students should join early, at least five minutes before the start of class. Students should be on, which means be on mute and have your video on so the instructor can see you, and then unmute yourself if you have something to say. Be prepared for class. Read the lessons, take notes, and write down your questions. Be considered online. What may work for you could be a distraction to others. Participate and pay attention in class discussions and breakout rooms. If you have questions, write them down and ask at the appropriate time. Remember, you are on camera. Be considerate and be careful. All classes are recorded for compliance and review. On breaks, do not exit the meeting. Let the instructor know if you need to step away and when you come back. And if you're experiencing technical issues or the instructor is experiencing technical issues, keep trying, communicate with the instructor, and make up any work that's missed, which may mean that you need to reschedule a class. It should go without saying. Anything you say or do online creates a permanent record. You already know it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Keep messages to a minimum. Do not spam your students or send them an overwhelming amount of texts and emails. Avoid subjects of politics or religion. Do not gossip or make fun of people. No bullying. Always use professional language and demeanor. No swearing, racial slurs, or sexual references. And avoid anything resembling or that could be considered sexual harassment. It takes two. It takes effort from both the students and the instructors to create an effective learning environment. To maintain an ideal learning environment, it is important to reinforce the norms by reminding the students and yourself what is expected of them. Review with the students the expectations periodically. Renew your commitment and recommit the students as needed. There is a story about a successful businessman who wanted to hire a chauffeur to drive his family around. As he interviewed the top three candidates, he presented them with this scenario. Imagine you are driving my family in a high mountain pass. The road is very narrow, with mountains to one side and a steep cliff on the other. How close could you get to the edge of the cliff without going over? The first candidate said, I could get within three inches and not go over. 
The second Canada said one inch. I could get within one inch and not go over. The third Canada said, I would stay as far away from the edge as possible. Which driver do you think he hired? If you guessed the third one, you're correct. The third candidate was the only driver who recognized his responsibility, which was to stay away from the edge and keep the man's family safe. Remember, we are all different and unique individuals. What you may think is fine or appropriate may be offensive to others. As a professional, it's your job to keep their feelings and values in mind. Be like the third driver. Don't flirt with the line. Keep it professional. As instructors, you should model the ideal behavior. Your students will look to you as an example and for guidance and will mimic your behavior. Always maintain professional boundaries. Be respectful to everyone. Arrive early to class. Be organized and prepared, which means you should know the material. And prepare questions in advance to get your students involved. Reflect upon the needs of your individual students and recognize and encourage their hard work and growth. We all want to enjoy our work and have fun when we can. Creating a class that encourages participation will not only help increase learning, but it'll just be more fun as well. When you come to class, be enthusiastic and encourage the students to be enthusiastic. Challenge them. Encourage mistakes and make them feel safe when they make a mistake. Guide students to the right answers. Build upon previous knowledge and experiences, both yours and that of the students. And practice asking effective questions and improving the questions that you ask. Part of being an effective teacher is asking effective questions. It takes planning. Have questions prepared and written down. Examples of less effective questions are, any questions? That usually gets no response. Do you understand this? That usually gets a bunch of heads shaking yes. It doesn't really tell you or teach you anything. Examples of effective questions. Who can name one of the six rights of medication administration? Or, where should controlled substances be stored? These questions are examples of open-ended questions and they prompt a more thoughtful response. Tips for asking effective questions. Call on students by name, don't just wait for volunteers. Avoid asking yes or no questions. Be encouraging even if the wrong answer is given. Provide feedback. Don't try to trick your students or outsmart them. Just be straightforward and consistent in your communication. Be helpful and provide hints and clues if they're stuck. If the students did not understand what was taught, try taking a different approach and reteach the material. Give and accept feedback. If used correctly, feedback can edify the student-teacher relationship and help the student feel more comfortable and confident in class. Likewise, accepting feedback and suggestions from the students to improve how you deliver your instruction will help you be a better teacher, build trust with the students, and act as an example for them. When giving student feedback, Giving feedback helps students know where they are in class and what they need to work on. Feedback should support the education efforts. Feedback should be given in a timely manner, immediately if possible, but don't wait weeks to comment on a student's work or behavior. Be encouraging, not critical. Be genuine, sincere, and direct. Recognize and praise the student's efforts and their strengths. Don't overwhelm the student. If there are multiple things that they can work on, just pick the one key thing that you think they should work on now. Then always remember to document the interaction and the outcome. Things to consider when giving feedback. What can the student do? What are their strengths and talents? What can't the student do? What are their weaknesses? How does the student's work compare to the work of other students? How can the student improve? And how can you help support the student in their efforts to improve? Accepting feedback. To be an effective teacher, we have to be students as well and be willing to learn and improve. Teachers should plan and build mechanisms to collect feedback in their class. When you get feedback from either administrators or students, don't take it personal. Ask clarifying questions. Try to avoid being defensive. Take time to think and reflect upon what you've heard. And don't try to improve everything all at once. Make a plan and then stick to it. Address issues quickly. Whenever a group of people get together, 
the potential for disagreement and issues to arise always exists. Sometimes an issue can be ignored, such as a momentary disagreement. However, there are times when an issue can't be ignored and must be dealt with. Issues that should not be ignored include repeated failure to observe class norms, unwillingness to meet student expectations, potentially offensive and disrespectful behavior, distractions or issues that interfere with learning, potentially dangerous situations, or ongoing arguments or personal issues. Remember to take a moment. When an issue occurs in class, it can be very frustrating, upsetting, and extremely distracting. Sometimes it can even make you feel like an ineffective teacher. When this happens, take a moment and breathe. Remain positive. Try to understand where the behavior is coming from. Be aware of cultural differences that might be influencing the issue. Focus on rewarding appropriate behavior. This is a method of looking for what they are doing right instead of looking for what they are doing wrong. Sometimes just this practice can help reduce inappropriate behavior. If you can, ignore the behavior which might just be an attempt to get your attention. And finally, if you're frustrated or need help, please reach out to Student Services. How to address classroom issues. When something occurs in class that needs to be addressed, take the time to do it in a way that will not embarrass or single out the student. If addressing the issue during class, try using proximity or moving closer to the student. Sometimes just moving a little closer will help correct any behavior. Rearrange seating or groups if possible. Reorient the student behavior by asking them a question. Ask calmly those involved if side discussions can wait until after class. When addressing an issue after class, ask to talk with the student in private. We recommend inviting another instructor or administrator to the conversation. Describe to the student specifically the misbehavior and reinforce the expectations. Take care to not make the issue personal. Insist that the student take responsibility for their actions. Ensure the student knows it is the behavior that is unacceptable, not them. Then document the conversation. When addressing student-to-student -student issues, in an ideal world, adults would be able to work out their own issues, search for mutual understanding, and make peace. However, this is not always the case. From time to time, it might be necessary to intervene to ensure that student issues do not distract from learning. Take time to get both sides of the story. Talk it over respectfully. Depending on the issue, invite both parties to a group discussion. Again, if necessary, invite another instructor and administrator to join the discussion. Collaborate with all parties involved to develop a solution. Ask everyone to commit to the solution. Inquire if there's anything you can do to help, and then document the conversation. Addressing issues between the student and instructor. Occasionally, issues may arise between the student and the instructor. If this occurs, typically it is because at some point the student-teacher relationship has deteriorated. To resolve student-instructor issues, listen with the intent to empathize and understand what the student is going through. Explain what your intent was without becoming defensive. Ask them to repeat what they heard to check for understanding. If appropriate, apologize to the student. Determine the next steps to move forward and document the conversation. You are not alone. This is an organization invested in the success of our students, which means we are invested in your success as well. We want you to feel excited and energized when you come to class. Resources for your success. Communicate with us often about class and student progress so we can identify ways to support you. Let us know if you have suggestions or needs. Ask for help when needed. Refer students who are struggling to tutoring. Attend professional development sessions when offered. Motivation. Keeping students motivated can make your job a lot easier and help reduce a lot of potential issues in class. It is not your job to entertain the students, but being consistent as a teacher and providing both praise and feedback can go a long way. Building excitement and keeping students motivated. Be clear and consistent with your expectations. Praise efforts, progress, and hard work. Give timely feedback and suggest ways to improve. Listen attentively to the students and empathize with them. Challenge students and encourage self-reflection on their own work. Hold them responsible and accountable for their own success. Offer support and resources as you can.
renew and reflect. We want to take this moment to thank you for the work that you are doing. It means so much to us and to your students. You are a critical component in helping your students achieve their dreams, and we couldn't do this without you. Remember to renew. Take time for yourself. Find ways to relax and to let go of things that are happening inside the classroom. Find a way to keep it fresh and fun, and always ask for help when needed. As a professional, it's also important that you reflect upon the work that you are doing. Recognize what is working and what is not. Don't get emotionally attached to anything. Be willing to let it go if it's not working. Think about your needs and the needs of the students, and then continue to learn and develop your new skills. Thank you for your time here with me today. Thank you for everything you do. Please reach out to me with any comments, questions, or insights.